Most recently, his study, he has been studying how to improve biofuel plants. Um, in the last eight years, Dr. Twig has been awarded about $10 million in grant funding, and he's also been the mentor to 37 master's and PhD students and about 150 undergraduate research projects. Tonight, Dr. Twig will be recalling how he got to this point and how, why he does what he does in his lecture entitled Dancing Phospholipids, Handcuffs, and Mummified Tweakings. There's always an explanation. So please um, join, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Twig. I think everyone who probably starts out this kind of lecture wonders, are you wishing it was the last time? <laughs> are you wishing, wishing it was the last lecture for those of you that have had me for class? Or are you last because there's an asteroid coming? Or is it last because I'm retiring? Is it last because I'm dying? Or what? So I, I just decided it was last. I don't know why, I guess. But, but, we'll, but we'll, we'll see. Um, some, uh, some of you, at least a few of you, had the luxury of having had me, and I say luxury, I don't know if it's luxury or not, having had me for class, so you'll understand the title. Uh, others of you will be looking at that and thinking, what the hell was he talking about? I have no idea. Um, and, and for your benefit, I, I included a couple of things, and I don't know how well these will turn out, we'll see. I got dancing phospholipids, that's Gene, that's Gene Kelly and Donald O'Connor. Uh, for those of you that know what I'm talking about, I do a demonstration in class, and I'll replicate it for your entertainment, where I, where I demonstrate how a membrane is either solid or liquid. And you do that by being a phospholipid. Now I realize, and I think I sat, did I sit next to you at the recognition dinner? You're from music, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking you have no, no idea what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> so for your, for your edification, a phospholipid is something that makes up your membrane and it's got a polar end that likes water and an end that hates water. And if I pretend, if you will, that this part of me is the head group and these part are my tails, I become a dancing phospholipid. Because if I'm saturated, those chains ain't straight if I stand next to, like, for example, Rachel that did it in class with me the other day, I can solidify quite easily with my next door neighbor and still maintain my ability to, to spin around to maintain my freedom of rotation. But on the other hand, if I'm unsaturated, I'm kinked out, if you will, and I kick away my next door neighbor and take up more space, which was Rachel the other day. So that's my, if you will, and I, and I do all sorts of things where I then demonstrate how much space I occupy on the floor, <laughs> and all sorts of other things like that. So that's the dancing phospholipid part. The handcuffs part, what does that have anything to do with? It does not have anything to do with the fact that I've spent any time in prison. <laughs> what it has to do with is my explanation of how a enzyme inhibitor that's non-competitive works. Um, again, I'm taking for granted that I'm speaking to, let's say, a music person who has no idea what I'm talking about. An enzyme is a biological catalyst that does things, does reactions, helps out reactions, and some there are types of things that inhibit that. And some of those are what are called non-competitive, which means that they bind to you regardless of what else you do. Kind of like a pair of handcuffs would bind to you, yet still leave your active sites able to work. The last one is mummified Twinkies. Twinkie mummies, they actually exist. I made up this example in class not that long ago and then realized when I went home, went to my office and Googled it, that mummified Twinkies or Twinkie mummies do exist, where you take icing and essentially make a Twinkie into a mummy as a Halloween treat for kids. Uh, I was explaining why trans fats were unnatural and kind of bad talking about the shape of them, how they were nice and straight, how they were all made by um, uh, artificial means, by chemical means. Of course, say Dr. Thomas back there would know, I'm sure. Um, and, and how they were, if not really indigestible, but on the other hand were, were um, something that took a very long time to spoil. And I, and I postulated that if you were to open up the mummy's tombs, which we now know store grain, I think, right? Um, follow your politics, you know what that meant. If you don't, you'd have no idea what that meant. Um, 
the, that inside would be Twinkies that would be perfectly edible because they wouldn't have spoiled. And I postulated that they would probably come in their own little gold sarcophagus. Stupid things that I say in class that people remember. My current classes have Twitter feeds and people tend to, tend to send me the things that I say that are silly, like mummified Twinkies and Hello Kitty shirts and other things like that. And it's all in aid of hoping at least that you remember what the heck I was talking about. So I'll be talking a little bit about that kind of stuff. For those of you like Caitlin who've had me in class for other things, you may have think I was perhaps gonna come in and draw you say the TCA cycle. Um, although she's plenty familiar with the dancing phospholipids too. Um, and in some cases, perhaps that's what you, what you would think of. Somebody from science, they do that, those reactions and things, and we don't want to hear any more about that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking with you about that. On the other hand, what I'd like to talk with you about, I guess, if this is my last lecture and you're indulging me in whatever the heck it is that I like to say, is to tell you how I got to be here and some of the things that have sort of made my being here worthwhile, let's put it that way. Um, in order to do that, you have to know a little bit of background. I'm from a relatively moribund, if you recognize that word, depressing, industrial place called Ford City, Pennsylvania. It's in the middle of, of uh, well, a little bit north of Pittsburgh. I always say I'm from Pittsburgh, but anybody who asks. But this is where I'm from. This is what I think of. Better yet, perhaps that one. That's the Allegheny National Forest, which is near to where I, to where I grew up. Um, for those of you that know me and know me well, you know I'm not a particularly religious person, but if anything ever feels like a cathedral to me, it's that kind of forest. I can wrap my arms around trees that have been here longer than Jesus would have been. Can't wrap my arms around them, they're big. But that's where I come from. Now, on the other hand, what I also come from is factories and coal mining. I think one of the first times I met Dean LeDuc, I described myself and anyone else who would ever listen to me when I talk, is that I, that I came from a blue collar attitude. I may teach in a white collar profession, but deep down I'm dirty. I don't mean that way. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm used to mucking in the dirt. And that's where I came from. Um, some things that have that have formed me, if you will, in a certain respect. One of them is this piece of machinery. And you may look at that wondering, is this out of some sort of horror movie? What is that? This is what's called a continuous minor. This is the kind of thing my dad drove. And what happens is these nasty looking things on the front spin around and then oscillate up and down, ripping out coal. You can almost sort of hear the Victorian nature of things, right? Things belching out huge amounts of, of, of uh, coal dust. To give you an idea of the way they worked, this was what my dad did. Okay? In 1972, I was born in 65, for those of you that are keeping track. In 1972, so I was about six years old, maybe seven, it was close to Halloween. I remember mostly because my mom and I were playing a board game that had something to do with with uh, dungeons and little things that fell. This was, of course, for those of you that are too young before the internet existed or anything like that. You could not be amused by your mobile device. Your mobile device was your brain, maybe an edge of sketch. Um, a knock came on the door that my dad had been in a coal mine accident. He'd been driving this kind of machine, which you can guess, that, that person was sitting, so his legs were essentially stretched out in front of him. Had been, my dad had been in a cave-in, and 
at the time, I, that was all we know. I was rushed down the street to where my grandparents lived, about a block away. Um, and then began what I guess I could I guess I could call about two years of what must have been hell for my dad. He spent the next two years in, in the hospital. His leg from his knee down, he was lucky in that respect. He's still alive today, 78. His leg was crushed. And an old time, if you will, physician named Dr. Fair decided to have a go at putting my dad's leg back together again. So 20 some odd surgeries later, pins in, pins out, plates in, plates out, rods in, rods out, my dad still had a leg. But for a six-year-old boy, I mean, when your dad's always, and I, and I, if some of you have similar things where you perhaps lost a dad, I, no, I'm not trying to be any different than maybe you have been. I'm not calling anything that I've had any sort of suffering that didn't make me what I am today. But um, he sort of he doesn't really cease to exist in your life, but he's not there. I mean, during the time when you should have had someone to play ball with, he wasn't there. And even for the next time after that, my dad came home, couldn't work for, he was out of, out of work for six years until he was deemed um, in, in good enough health to go back to work. Meanwhile, the, the company that he worked for kept sending him to be recertified as being disabled. So in other words, they didn't believe him. Um, what protected my family at the time, and I won't go into a lot of politics, was the coal miners union. Well, the sort of, if you will, kind of happy part of this, if you will, is my grandfather. None of the men in this picture is my grandfather, but it's what it perhaps would have looked like. My grandfather was born in 1912. And he went into a coal mine when he was 17 years old. He came out of that same hole in the ground 45 years later to retire. Uh, when he started working, he wore one of these things on his head. I don't know if you guys know what this is or not. Um, this is called a carbide lantern. You guys know what these are? For those of you that are unfamiliar, these gentlemen are wearing them on their heads. It looks like their heads are on fire. What, they, what this is, is something into which you put water. And then once you put the water in, you screw it back together. And into the little opening on the top, you drop a piece of calcium carbide. And as it sits in the water, it evolves acetylene gas. I won't bother you with the chemical nature of or anything like that, but, but acetylene gas, is, of course, is like an acetylene torch. Just there, of course, it's pressurized. And this is what my grandfather did for a living. Um, he literally, when he did this kind of thing, he, I, didn't, in my, I was an only grandchild for about eight years, and even at that, only one of three after that. I was regaled with tales of this, that, or the other. And I know one of the jobs he had before this, so under 17. So this would have been before 1929, which when he would have been 17. He worked in a brewery and where he was paid in beer, right? I'm sure, it, I'm sure it, some of it made it home. But uh, this was a step up. He told me at the time about how he got paid by the ton. He was given little metal medallions that you hung on your cart and you shoved it out and at the end of the day they would be counted. And I think he said he got paid like a quarter a ton. So this is where I come from. This is what this is what I I kind of feel like I am, if you put it that way. I'm sure a lot of you were perhaps raised on ranches or farms and you can sympathize that that's what you feel like you're from, right? Um, to an extent, um, as I moved into this 
you know, one thing when my, 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 I went away to college, you know, just to keep it short, my dad told me, I don't really care what you do for a living. I could have been a dancer and he'd have been fine with that. Just don't end up back in the mine. Because it had tried to take his life, I'm sure. You know, it was, a, it was at the time a good livelihood for a lot of folks who lived where I did. The town that I showed you lived and died on coal and, and believe it or not, am I making it up, toilets. We had, we had a place that cast toilets. My uncle did that for a living. And we also had Pittsburgh plate glass, which is what Ford City is named after. A guy named Ford founded Pittsburgh plate glass. Um, but to an extent, I don't, and I, I guess I won't talk too much about it, but I always felt a little guilty that this, that, that I made it out and a lot of folks didn't. So it's always the reason why I approach this job as blue collar, right? I feel privileged to be here. I feel privileged to bust my ass on a, on a daily basis. And if it takes making a fool in front of you to, to dance like a fossil lip or anything else to help you remember something, it's what I'm here for. A couple other quick pictures for your amusement. Now that these are terrible because they were taken with what were called Instamatic cameras at the time. That's me in 1993 in the top. I know, I look much bigger then because I was. I weighed about 190 pounds, so about 50 pounds more than I do now. And I had a mustache. The gentleman I'm standing next to is my pal, my grandfather, whose name was Lloyd. Um, for your amusement also, he had brothers named Clarence, who went by Babe. Boris, who went by Hoke. Um, Wiley, like Wiley Coyote. Wiley, who went by, wait for it, Toot. <laughs> um, and maybe one more, little Blair, who actually went by Blair. If my grandfather had a nickname, I don't know. Uh, he, he was always Pat to me. And that's me then sitting next to him a couple of years later in 95, just after my grandmother, who I've ignored up there, uh, standing next to him had passed. He was eight, he was seven years, almost eight years older than her, but she passed first. She smoked an awful lot of cigarettes and weighed too much, to be honest. Um, she passed away of acute pancreatitis when she was 75. He lived to be 92. That's him gladly accepting a, again, wait for it, manure sculpture that I had bought for him to put in his garden. And I partially tell you all this because, as uh, Nicole told you, my PhD is in botany. Where plants started for me was my pal, my grandpa. He had a huge garden out in the backyard. And since I was about eight years old, old enough to pick up a shovel and dig into the clay, I spaded his garden. My grandfather did what he called double digging. You know what this is? You dig a hole, you put it to the side, you dig another hole, you throw it in the first hole. So it's kind of like tilling without a tiller, right? So in terms of starting out to do what I did, that's where I came from. But my grandfather was, for all intents and purposes, my dad for a long time. He put the, put, took the training wheels off my bike and instilled with me the love of plants that I had, even though he himself spent his time basically working with fossilized plants in the coal mine. He retired a blast for him. And what that means is he worked with dynamite. Um, so as you might guess, 4th of July is amusing around our place. <laughs> uh, this is just as a real quick, and this is my, my the, the title of this could have been just, let me tell you a quick story. Here's a quick story. We, remember I mentioned to you that the made, place that made toilets, All right, where there was toilet, well, the toilets that didn't make it were the wear that they dumped. We would blow those up. <laughs> Fourth of July was a hoot. Um, coming to what makes my life worthwhile at UNK. Now, Nicole already mentioned a lot of things that, that tend to get you accolades, like the amount of grant dollars that, that you get or the amount of students that you work with. Now, the, the, the 35 
37 graduate students and 150 undergraduates. That's over the 20, almost four years that I've been here. So that's not like the last, the last eight where the, where the grant dollars came from. But it's an awful lot. If you added that out over time, well, we have what, about at least five students a year or so, right? And, and I, could, I could count up for you uh, all the medical professionals that I've sent away to school. In that time, there must be at least 150 MDs, an equal amount of physician's assistants and physical therapists, and probably more than that, pharmacists and other things. So I feel like I, if I, if you will, my wings are fairly big that way. Um, and I, and I, and I, for those of you that know me and know me fairly well, you know that I'm a fan of hockey. Um, there was a, a, a tremendous hockey player who played for, for the Pittsburgh Penguins named Mario Lemieux. And you probably don't know who he is because he's been retired long, as long as most of you have been alive. But he was a center and his, his saying was that a good center lifts his wings. So the center carries the puck down the ice, the wings trail along, he throws them the puck, they score. If anything, I'd like to think, I'd like to feel like I'm the center, right? I want to throw somebody else the puck for them to score. So my last three things, if you will, are a couple of those things. One of these is a young lady named Christine that I'll tell you about. And I've been, I've been privileged to have a, a close relationship with a lot of undergraduates and, and males and females alike. I think I tend to end up working with more females than males, but I think that's, they're just, they're more numerous in our classes these days. But Christine was one of them. And to make kind of a long story short, Christine showed up here as a transfer from a university in Wisconsin. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's been a ways back. And she came to UNK to, to uh, work with undergraduate research, if you ask her, that's specifically the reason she came. And she didn't work with me. She's doing tissue culture in that hood. She worked with somebody named Kim Carlson, who, who many of you will also know. Um, who, who had another quick sidebar, which I could have named this, I just got sidetracked along the way. I keep telling people that's what I should call my life story. Uh, I'm teaching Biology 106 now. For 23 years, I taught something called cell biology, which is juniors. And I, to be honest, I decided I had kind of got a little too in a rut, a little too doing the same thing over again, decided I needed to change. So now I'm teaching biology 106. And I realized when I was having my first lab meeting, that is to say with all the people who were instructing labs for me, that all the people who were instructing labs for me were my former students, including Dr. Carlson. Corey Willicott, Ann Cummings, all my former students. Now, separated with a great amount of time. Corey only graduated a couple of years ago, and maybe 10 years ago, Dr. Carlson, well, shortly after I got here, 20 some odd years ago. But uh, anyway, Christine worked for Dr. Carlson, and Christine was academically not the best student in the world. She struggled to get bees sometimes in classes. But she was very dedicated to her research. Um, and Christine was, without to put a lot of, a lot of time into it, um, hobbled a little bit by personal problems. Um, she, she, her father, to put it bluntly, was a, a sap, I'll, I'll not go any further than that, a terrible person somebody who had cheated on the family and, and, and ended up leaving them high and dry when she was 14. For some reason or another, she kind of looked at me and saw dad. So we ended up spending a lot of time together. I have um, something I call the wall of fame, right, in my, in my lab, which is people get to paint a block after they've worked for me for a while. Christine never really worked for me, but she has a block on my wall of fame. Nonetheless, um, we were on a trip to Lincoln. She, were, she was to present at the Academy of Sciences, for those of you who know what that is. 
and um, she had wanted to go to an eight o'clock class and I taught an eight o'clock class so she didn't go in the van, she rode with me. Later and also on the trip was another graduate student named Don Yesa who would also belong to Dr. Carlson, um, a Romanian student, um, who's now of course at the dental school in Lincoln. Uh, but uh, we were riding there, and first time I had ever noticed anything with Christine to have what looked like a what looked like an engagement ring in her hand. I said, "Did you get engaged over the weekend?" She was in the back seat, so I could see it in the mirror. And she ended up explaining to us that she had been engaged for quite a while. She just didn't wear it that much. And I just I, the, the the discussion went on as we drove from here to Lincoln, and came to be that that. She had bought the engagement ring herself, which was, to me, was like one of those, what? Like, seriously? You're engaged to somebody whose ring you had to buy? How low must your self-esteem be, right? Um, and maybe that's not exactly the case, but we, we gave her grief about it, and Yesa and I both. Um, turned out to be they, she decided to talk with us a bit more that, that she was that the, they, they had problems and you know like anybody does but the, the you know the guy had like a DUI couldn't couldn't drive she had to take him to work it's like more more of this is like you're a bright girl what are you doing with this you know talk we talking talking over time a couple we got back from the meeting a couple weeks passed by she showed up at my office and wanted to talk some more about other things. Turned out to be they were having problems more than that. They lived in a rent controlled place because they didn't have much for money. Um, over by where Casey's is now, by that CrossFit place. Um, and uh, and uh, before long, again, to make this story pass by a little bit so you don't have to be too bored listening to me. Um, before too long, she she asked me if I would help her move her stuff out. So I helped her load up all of her stuff in my pickup truck, meanwhile wondering by the guy who she had been engaged to who was standing there looking at us, not very nicely as you might guess, try, trying to engage me while I walked by him as if he didn't exist to a certain extent, because I was there for her. And we ended up sitting having an ice cream somewhere and she was telling me about other things and I jokingly said to her, I might as well be your dad. Well, as time went by, Christine asked me to give her away in her wedding. She sends me Father's Day cards. I don't have children. Right? That's me with her mom. We both walked her down the aisle. And that's me, I don't know, with some sort of attempt of a weird grin on my face, uh, having the father-daughter dance. So it, it bewilders me when I run into anyone who says that they don't enjoy and don't want to work with undergraduates. I mean, why would you rob yourself? The opportunity to have it, even even have the opportunity to think about having that kind of relationship. I've got a couple more that I'll uh, quick moments that I'll give you. Things that that made you and Kay worthwhile, or have made you and Kay worthwhile to me, but have nothing to do with teaching morality. One of them. Uh, and I, and I won't talk too much about it because I thought he might be here this evening and didn't come, involves somebody named Frank Kovacs. For those of you that know him, uh, Frank Kovacs teaches uh, organic, or not organic chemistry, I looked at Alan and got organic chemistry in my head, teaches biochemistry, amongst other things here at UNK. Maybe some of you have had him in class before. Um, Frank is the father of a, proud father of a, a little boy named Frank. He was once the proud father of a, of a young girl named Sarah. And again, I won't say too much because Frank isn't here to hear me talk about it, but at one time, Sarah got to be, 
young Jean would remember if you were here. Um, well, I think in the ballpark of 15 years old. It was around Easter. She had a, she, her birthday was around Easter. They had a cake. She got the Incredibles DVD. I remember seeing the pictures. Within a, within a, a few days, she was sick with something that seemed like the flu. They treated her and it kind of went away. And before long, you know, they would, that, that treatment was fine. They thought she was going to be cool. But before long after that, she, she could barely breathe. They took her to the hospital. They didn't know what to do with it. She was bleeding out of her lungs. She turned out to have an autoimmune disorder called Wegener's syndrome, where her own immune system was attacking her lung lining. And I, Frank and I would talk. Um, Frank and I are as, as different as two people might be. Frank is, is deeply religious, as I've already alluded to, I'm not. Frank is very conservative politically, yeah, as you guessed, and I'm not. Um, we share very little in common in that respect, but I, I, I don't think I have anyone here who's at UNK who I would call a closer friend. And I remember we were in the lab on a Saturday or a Sunday, and I asked him, how was Sarah? How was Sarah coming? What was, well, because this was now about a month later. She had been on a heart lung machine. She, she wasn't able to breathe that, that bad. Any time they went in and tried to clean anything, she, she would bleed. And, and he looked at me and, and said that they were going to have to unplug her. They were going to have to let her go. And I, at, at that point, I, there was nothing I could do but wrap my arms around him and cry. And it's, again, one of the things that I feel like made my being here worthwhile. Frank would say it's something to do with God. I, I would say it's just kismet. Look it up if you don't know what that means. I deal with all sorts of things like that. And then the last one that I'll tell you about, I'll make short as well. Um, but it involves, I guess, my definition of home. I found myself talking to my parents not that long ago, and undoubtedly you all do it sooner or later. You're standing in their house and you, and you end up thinking to yourself or talking about, well, I'll, I'll do it when I get back home. And you realize that where you're standing isn't home anymore. This home isn't a place, really, is it? Home is where your heart is to make you know, Hallmark cards out of it, I guess. So the third moment that I have is somebody who is here tonight. She doesn't know I'm gonna say anything, and I won't say too much, but, but when she was a new faculty member, um, I don't think she'd care that it say some of this things about her, but she had been the victim of horrible sexual abuse by her own graduate advisor. Imagine that, you know, the person you've entrusted your development to takes advantage of you that way. So much so that she was having flashbacks and would end up in the hospital. Well, today, if you will, she's my home. She's my wife. It's Dr. Steele who's sitting back there videoing me. So if I had three reasons why being here mattered, maybe if I wanted to make it four, and one of them would be the students, then the other three would be Christine, Frank, and Jen. And I think that's about all I really have to say. I guess. That's what makes my time worthwhile. Other than that, I could talk forever. I, I could talk to the wall for an hour if you like. Thank you.